Thank you, Tom. Are we on? Yes. Good morning. My name's... Not all of a sudden I feel taller, right? <laughs> Good morning. My name's Ed Mutum, and I'm an alcoholic. By the grace of God, the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous and sponsorship, I have been found necessary to take a drink or a mood-altering chemical since January 5th, 1971, and for that I'm extremely grateful. My home group is the Big Book Study Group in Davenport, Iowa. We meet at 6 p.m. every Tuesday night. We, it's a small meeting. We'd like to keep it that way. Thank you. <laughs> no, we'd love to have you any time. Well, I want to thank Tom for being my host and being my friend. He's a, he's a good man and a good member of Alcoholics Anonymous. I want to thank Ann and the committee and just everybody. Uh, I've just uh, Everybody's been delightful. And, of course, the speakers, you know. Somebody says, oh, Sunday morning must be tough. No, a Sunday morning has already been said so well. And, you know, uh, let's give a hand to the speakers before we did just such a wonderful job. I noticed Cliff already left, but I won't bring it up. And, uh, and Charlie, but it'll never pass these lips. But. Wasn't Charlie great with his kids? I just love that. I just love that. And I've been blessed to know a lot of the speakers a, a long time, uh, not only behind the podium, and I'll tell you about everybody of the speakers that I know that talked, one thing I can tell you, they're the same down there as they are up here, and that's the essence of Alcoholics Anonymous. If this ever changes the way I am down there, I'll quit this. And I learned that here in Alcoholics Anonymous. I, uh, some of you may have noticed I'm tall, and... Uh, it's kind of funny, This rest, the hotel has been great. I go down there to the restaurant, and I have to duck to get in a little bit, you know, because, yeah, it's a short doorway. So the hotel staff, I got here Wednesday, and starting Wednesday evening, when I'd come in, the, all the hotel staff would bow to me as I come in. There. <laughs> <laughs> but it's always the same two questions by the same size. First question, first question is, oh, how tall are you? And I say 6'10", and they say, oh, do you play basketball? <laughs> I say, no, how tall are you? And I say, 5'4". I say, do you play miniature golf? <laughs> Seems fair to me, you know. <laughs> they made the rules, you know. <laughs> I come from a very elite group of people called White Crash and... Well, when you, have a, when you have a position in the community, there's a lot of things that are required, you know. And, uh, by God, we filled them all, I'll tell you. And I laugh and joke about that now, but I also need to tell you that was the toughest thing for me to shake after I got sober, was that I was dirt, that I was nothing, that there was something deep wrong with me that you don't seem to understand. And I can laugh and joke about it now with the freedom, because you have convinced me that I am anything but, and so are you. And I just love that. I love that in Alcoholics Anonymous. I want to tell you three things before I forget them because they're the most important things in my life. I love Alcoholics Anonymous. I love God and I love being sober and I don't apologize for any of the three. And I used to have to make excuses, you know. And I want to make it clear before I go on with my story one thing and, and make it absolutely clear that anything good and precious in my life is a direct result of working these steps, sponsorship, and Alcoholics Anonymous and a kind and loving God that loved me long before I would even uh, admit his existence. Uh, because that's very important, you know. Uh, we can get up here and we can talk. And I always got to remember, I always got to remember, but for the grace of God. I want to do something a little different this morning, too. I just want to take a moment of silence. We've had a lot of moments of silence. I like that. But I want to take a moment to remember those members who aren't here with us this year. They may have passed on as old timers. They may have gone out. Uh, but I want to just take a moment and lift them up, lift their memory, and uh, uh, send them all the love that we've been feeling since here, since Wednesday. Okay, let's just take a minute and do that. Amen. I, uh, I went to my first AA meeting when I was 10 years old. <laughs> I suppose I had some signs showing. 
I think it was, was it you, Scott, that talked about potential, or was it Charlie? Somebody talked about potential. I had the potential to be an alcoholic by ten, I guess. And my brother took me to a meeting, and I can remember it was some old guy up here, about twenty, twenty-five. My name's Fred, and I'm an alcoholic. I'm good for you, Fred. You know, geez. But if I ever get old and burn out, I'll be here too. Well, I didn't know I was a prophet at that point. It took a few years. But, but I share that with you because we have some wonderful members of Al-Anon here. And uh, I just share that because I was exposed to Alcoholics Anonymous and the goodness in Al Alcoholics Anonymous. And it didn't faze me. Because I had the same problems then that I had when I got sober. Memories of what might have been, if only. I don't know about you, but it's been described very well by Terry and so many of the other speakers. I had that hole in my gut with the wind blowing through, and I just ached at an early age. I didn't like my family, and I instinctively knew you shouldn't feel that way. I knew that. So I felt guilty. My, some of my earliest memories were guilty because I felt certain things that I know I shouldn't feel, and I did anyway. And uh, I... Uh, I drank from a very early age. I don't know when I took my first drink because Dad used to think it was funny to get me drunk. And uh, I was the youngest of seven. I'm the baby. You should see my big brothers. <laughs> and uh, I know this, that it has been described so well once again, that alcohol did for me what I could not do for myself. It made the, it made the world tenable. It made the world okay. I wasn't afraid of you anymore. In fact, there wasn't a number of you that could whip me. You know, the right, and I became a cop fighter at a very early age. Uh, any other cop fighters in the room? Yeah, they, I found out something just wanted to share with you. I, I thought I'd share. There's always more of them. <laughs> Who knew, you know? But I, I hated, I hated authority. Uh, if you told me no, it was yes. I was a parent abuser of the worst kind. You know, I love when people, oh, my parents were so abusive to me and this and that and that. You know, I don't know about you, but I was terribly abusive to my parents. I ran them ragged, man. I ran them ragged. I can remember my mother telling me no, and I'd keep on her. And she'd go, no. No. And I'd keep on her. Sometimes took up to a half hour, maybe an hour, and she'd say, for crying out loud, Ed, just go do it. And I'd think, <laughs> I won. You know what people had the nerve to say about my mother and father because all us kids uh, were in uh, prisons and things like that? That somehow it was about my mother and father. My mother and father were two of the hardest working people I've ever known. They didn't give me this thing I got that I'm entitled to something for some reason. They worked for everything they ever had, but it was a gift that I got at an early age, I'll tell you. And I can remember when I was 28 years old, I was about eight years sober and had this job. I turned into some kind of big deal, and I went back home, and they had a front page uh, story on me, hometown boy makes good, and I'm staying with mom for some reason. And uh, I get dressed, and I'm going out and going to a meeting. I'm living in L.A. at the time, you know, I'm looking good. And... Uh, I'm going out and going to a meeting, and Mom says, where are you going? And I'm thinking, I'm 28 years old, 8 years sober, I travel all over the world, I don't need to tell you where I'm going. What I heard my mouth say is, I'm going to a meeting, Mom. You know what she said then? What time are you going to be home? <laughs> and in my head I said, what do you mean, what time am I going? I'm a full grown... That's what was going on in my head, what I heard my mouth say is, Mom, I'm going to go be out until about 10.30. If I'm going to be any later, I'll give you a call. You know what she had the nerve to say? You know what she had the nerve to say? Okay, honey. <laughs> it is the first time in my life at 28 years old I let my mother be my mother. It was always a war. And she didn't start it. I did. And it was up to me to end it. I was a parent abuser of the worst kind. I can remember when I got kicked out of school in my dad's generation, they used fists and engineer belts. And the engineer belt is about two and a half inches wide and got a good buckle on it or a straightened out hanger. And that's how you punish kids. And I got quickly kicked out of all the Davenport public schools. And I came home and my old man started beating on me because it's the only thing he knew to do. And he got done beating on me and I said, are you finished? And tears came to his eyes, and I thought, yeah, I broke him. 
and I did. I broke his heart. You see, I was his baby. I was his baby boy, and he did everything out of his arsenal he knew to do to straighten up a kid like me, and nothing worked. And nothing worked. I used to say he wasn't much of a father, and I regret that deeply today because I know he was the best father I ever had or ever will have. What he did that I wasn't able to do in sobriety was give my undivided attention to his family and do the very best he could. I wish I could have done that sober. I didn't. He did. As bad a drunk as he was, he was a dedicated... Mom used to tell the story about when, during the Depression, you got 25 cents for shoveling a ton of coal. 25 cents for a ton of coal. And she always told the story that Dad worked a 24-hour 24 day and made $18 because he had a family to feed. And that's my dad. And I got to break his heart. I was arrested by the Iowa Highway Patrol for possession of a sawed-off shotgun. I had a double-barreled 12-gauge that was about 14 inches long, and it seemed to require a lot of attention when I pulled that bad boy out. And the rooms are kind of clear, and I kind of liked it. I remember when I got arrested, the Iowa Highway Patrolman said, What are you doing with this gun? And I know nothing about guns to this day, probably even less than I did then. And so he said, What are you doing with this gun? And I said, I go rabbit hunting. He said, what do you do, run them down and beat them to death with it? <laughs> had no idea about that spread thing. I do. <laughs> and I believe in signalness of purpose. I absolutely believe in signalness of purpose. Uh, but I also need to tell you that uh, I was one of those, the one sentence you never heard me say is, a, what will this do to you? <laughs> I really didn't care. I really didn't care. And uh, I got down to 139 pounds at one point for not caring. And that was a lie I started telling a long time ago. Look what you're doing to your family. I don't care. Look what you're doing to your mother. I don't care. Look what you do eventually. Look what you're doing to that child and ex-wife. Tough beans, man. I don't care. And then I'd go to AA and they'd lie to me. They really would. You always hear I've never been lied to in AA. Well, I have. I come to AA and they said, you keep drinking and using like that, you're going to die. And I thought, excellent, when? They said, we'll restore your life. And I say, no thanks. If I liked it so much, it wouldn't need restoring. I'm so glad that I found out in Alcoholics Anonymous that we give you a new one here. That you can trash the old one if you want. A lot of us want to hang on to it for a long time. Why? Because... If we let go of that crap, we'd be happy, joyous, and free, and meetings would be 15 minutes, you know. <laughs> Funny, isn't it? I, uh, at the ripe old age of 16, I found a girl with a sufficiently bad reputation that I didn't have a chance of being rejected. And I went with her for a while. <laughs> a lot of things didn't change for a long time. But. We were, I was talking to somebody. The new dating thing when you're first sober. I forget who I was. I think maybe it was Terry I was talking to. And she, uh, somebody was telling me their date sat down and told them every rotten thing they ever did in the first five minutes. And I used to do that too. And I think, well, if I need them to know the worst, and then when they'd hear it all, they'd still say, I thought, boy, they're really sick to be sticking here. You know, no wonder I was single for a while. Uh, but I, uh, I remember uh, January 5th of 1971, I got sober, and I really didn't mean to. I absolutely didn't mean to. It was one of those days where I was hanging around A and A a little bit. Uh, the cops give me, sent me there, and I just thought, yeah, that's cute. Okay, we'll go there. And, and my brother still is sober. I mean, he's sober like 44 years. He's so dry, we don't let people smoke around him. You know what I mean? <laughs> and he, uh, he was always an excellent example of what an inspiration he's always been to me. But uh, January 5th of 1971, I got in a car wreck one more time. Now, I, I don't mean that to be cute. I got in car wrecks all the time. Uh, and the reason I do, I used to laugh and joke about drunk driving for a number of years sober. And about eight years ago, uh, I'm driving home one night. I was engaged to this gal, and uh, 
it was her homecoming. It was like one o'clock in the morning, and I was coming home. And I saw these kids. They were in the middle of the street, and all the doors of this Honda flew open. I thought, oh, good, Chinese fire girl at 1 a.m. That's what I need. I'm, you know, I just want to go home. And I pull around the corner, and I see a, a motorcycle laying on its side, and I see a body over by a pole here, and I realize the front clip of this Honda is gone. And uh, I turned off my vehicle, and I went out, and everybody's just standing there, and I, I screamed at him, call 911. And I went over, and I turned off the motorcycle and shut off the gas. And I went over, and there was this young lady standing there, or laying there. And she had her shirt up over her head, and I, I took her hand, and I started praying with her. And I said a selfish prayer. I said, God, don't let her die, please. Uh, uh, I, I, for about ten years, I couldn't stand the sight of blood, which is odd, but I couldn't stand it. And it was during that time. So I said that selfish prayer, and she stopped breathing. And I pulled that shirt down, and I gave her mouth to mouth, and I got her going. And uh, held her and prayed with her and tried to look right into her eyes and let her know she wasn't alone. And she went away again, and I got her back. And she went away again, and she didn't come back. I had a tall, blonde-headed young man behind me. So it only had two beers on it, so it only had two beers. And I looked at him in the kindest way I could, and I said, it would be in your best interest to back away from me. It would really be in your best interest to back away from me. And uh, my little friend died. Her parents called me. A week later, somehow they got my name. I didn't give it. And they wanted to know the last few minutes of their daughter's life, how that was. And they were Christians, so they were relieved that I was there and I was praying with her and she went to some peace. And then all of her friends needed to come and talk. She was only 20. Her mother and father had a real tough time with that. In fact, they started arguing. And the hospital bills started coming in because somehow a legal bind and she got the, all her hospital bills were her mother and father's troubles. And... Uh, Eventually, Marty, her dad, came to me and said, I said, how are you, Ed? She, he said, I'm not good, Ed. He said, the marriage is, it, we, just, we just can't stay together. They've been together 23 years. And I saw Marty a little bit later, and I said, Marty, how are you? He said, well, I come to see you, Ed. He said, I lost my job. He had had that job for 15 years. He was a manager of a restaurant. And he was an excellent manager. And uh, after the death of his daughter, uh, he couldn't quite track so well at work, so they let him go after eight months of trying to help him. And he said, I'm homeless, Ed. Can I, can I sleep on your couch? And I said, sure you can. Never did I understand the damage that drinking and driving does until that moment in time. And I don't mean to bring anybody down or make anybody feel guilty or any of that, but I just need you to know that our drinking affects people that you can't comprehend at all. I remember going to court and they asked me to testify and I said, no, I can't do that. I'm a recovering alcoholic and I understand that situation. said, so you don't understand. You're her only defense. If you don't testify, nothing happens to him. I said, I'm in. And I still had second givings as I walked into the courtroom because courtrooms weren't my favorite place to be. <laughs> and as I walked in, there was this guy on the stand and punk was going, I only had two beers. Man, I wasn't drunk. I, wasn't. I thought, okay. I ain't got no problem here. And I testified. And they convicted him for manslaughter. And he served three whole months. So I don't joke about too much about drinking and driving anymore. I think of my little friend and I think of her family. And if I'm ever following behind you when you're drinking and driving, I got a cell phone and I'll stay on your tail till I get your ass and I'll give him my card to testify. And I hope, God forbid, if I ever go out there and drink again, that you'll do the very same thing for me. January 5th, I got sober. I was laying in the middle of the street. It was 3 o'clock in the morning. We'd been in a car wreck. Uh, it was 18 below zero, and I was pretending like I was knocked out. It seemed like the thing to do at the time. I... And uh, the cops came up, and they said, that's mutum. Don't touch him. He's the scum of the earth. 
Cars probably hot don't even cover the little SOB. Little, they didn't say that. That was an exaggeration. The big SOB is what they said. And, uh, <laughs> they said don't even cover it. And an amazing thing happened. I didn't argue with them. I agreed. You know, it was real clear that night that I was there as a result of my actions. It had nothing to do with what I did or didn't have when I was a child. It had absolutely nothing to do with what I learned or didn't learn. It had nothing to do with my parents and their, their caliber of parenting. It had to do with the disease I had that's been through my family and generations. And the question was, when's the cycle going to stop for me? And I knew I couldn't do it alone. I absolutely, what a gift. I knew I couldn't do it alone. When I was little, I started doing something that I carried on into my sobriety for a long time, and i got to be real careful not to do it today sometimes. I'd walk into a room of 300 people, 299 would turn around to me and say, Ed, you're the best. We love you, man. You're good. And one person could go, jerk. Guess who I remembered? Now, I know you're not this sick, but after a while, I didn't recognize any of the 299 anymore. Just the jerks. And I put them in my bag of life. And if you do that five, six years old, 20, 25 years old, if you are even sober a while, if you start doing that, I'll tell you an amazing thing happens. Your wee knees get real weak, and eventually you can't help but fall. And so I came to AA with a bag full of ones about God, about society, about authority, about life in general. There were two types of people I didn't care for when I got sober. That was the living and the dead. <laughs> Both of them had caused me problems. And uh, so I, I, they rolled me into this hospital, and uh, there was a nurse there who obviously knew me. They didn't have a treatment center at that time. Uh, it was a moral issue because I had that other thing going, too. Uh, being a drunk was bad enough, believe me. And uh, they rolled me into this hospital, and this nurse said, Ed, do you want me to call AA? And I went, might as well. No, it's old-timers want to know why you new people can't be sincere like we were in the old days. <laughs> and she called AA, and I remember I was drinking the good stuff that night. It was the Mad Dog 2020. And it was... <laughs> oh, you know him. And did they have Ariba down here? Ariba? Oh man, that was 69 cents a quart. It could do it for you. The only trouble with Ariba is you had to hold your nose because if you got a whip of it, you were going to lose it. So you got to. And I got pretty good. I could get the whole quart down. And uh, only trouble with a wine drunk. I don't. Anybody here ever had a wine drunk? You get what they call the dry heaves. You know what I mean? <laughs> Time you could taste your toenails. <laughs> God wasn't drinking fun. And that's the way I was kind of feeling that morning. This AA member named Hat come in. Hat short for happy. And he walked in and said, Hi, Ed, my name's Hat. I'm from Alcoholics Anonymous and smiling. And I thought, Get out of my room. And he said, we don't drink and we don't use one day at a time. And I don't know why I got honest with him that day, but I said, I can't make it a whole day without something. See, when this gets going, this gets going, I'm in trouble. And he said, Ed, all you have to do is try. And that's the only thing I've done consistently from that day to this. Sometimes greatly, sometimes poorly, but I've tried to be a better person than I was yesterday, one day at a time. And I was so pleased that that's what he told me. He didn't fill my head with knowledge about alcoholism because, believe me, my head was busy enough. What I knew instinctively to do is to keep busy, and I started going to meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I was going through what they call withdrawal from a little bit of everything. And that's always funny. Is there any shakers here? Oh, good. Yeah, we got a bunch of shakers. You know, it's no fun anymore. Treatment centers, they've ruined shakers, haven't they? We get them in now and they go... And 
they're really no fun to play volleyball with. <laughs> but I was a shaker. Oh, jeez. Oh, man. How you doing, Heather? Oh, fine. How are you, Leslie? No, a cup of coffee? No, thanks. Cups chip my teeth. Oh, jeez. You want a piece of cake? No, no. Can't have sharp objects. And my arms are just can't. Yeah. <laughs> and I was a little quick. <laughs> and I had two rules. They were real simple rules. Don't come up behind me and don't touch me. You know? Real simple rules. And my friend Harry Stevens didn't know the rules. Harry was the coffee pourer in the, my home group. And Harry would come up behind me and he put his hand right here. And the moment he did, a peace came over me like I'd never known. And the madness stopped. And the churning stopped. And I could breathe. I didn't know what it was. And he poured my coffee. And he poured it slow. And then he'd go and he'd pull, and pull his hand away. And the minute he pulled his hand away, the madness would start again. And I'd drink that coffee just as quick as I could. So Harry put his hand on my shoulder. Big old tough guy in. That touch of unconditional love. Believe me, I wasn't anybody you'd want to touch when I got sober. I was one of those guys that people loved me enough to say, Eddie, go home and take a shower, buddy. Uh, you really smell bad and it's really offensive. Because I didn't care anymore. That wasn't on my priority list anymore. And I said, thanks. That's called love. That's called genuine care. You know, we talk about love here all the time. What are you showing to the people you can't stand? That's love, the other's convenience. What about the person that just repulses you? Like I'm sure I did many people. And they looked in my eyes anyway and said, Hi Ed, come on in. That's the Alcoholics Anonymous I know and love. That's what I've been given, and that's what I long to preserve. Yeah. A few years later, I was sober, and I was going through these deep, dark depressions. I know that's real hip now. Um, I was manic depressive long before it was fashionable. And... Uh, <laughs> And I remember I was going through these depressions, and, and my thought was, I'm going to go to my sponsor's house, go into his garage, turn on the gas, and just go to sleep. That was my plan. And when you're in that deep, dark spot, uh, you really don't leave notes and all that kind of crap. You just do it. And I was on my way home, and I stopped by the club at 26 and Broadway in Santa Monica, California. Yay, Santa Monica. And uh, Oskaloosa. Okay. <laughs> and I walked in, and there was a guy, Jimmy, and I'd known Jimmy for years. And I don't know if Jimmy said, Jimmy was funny. He was from Texas. He was a rapid fire talker. He'd talk like this. He'd give you three talks in time one. You know what I mean? He was just rapid fire. He was a salesman, lived in Malibu, California. He did real well for himself. He was a fine man. Actually, he said one time I asked some psychologist why I rubbed my hands together like this. Yes, see, he told me, he said, I smacked him right in the mouth. You know? That was Jimmy. And I told you my plan, and I walked into that place. I was just going to have a cup of coffee and then just go turn on the gas. And I walked in, and there was Jimmy. And I said, hi, Jimmy, how are you? And it was like the world stopped. And he looked me right in the eye, and he said, I'm much better for seeing you today, Ed. I'm much better for seeing you. He saved my life that day. You know what I thought? Well, if Jimmy likes me, maybe I got it wrong. If Jimmy likes me, I'll kill myself tomorrow. Do it one day at a time. And it works. Now, I haven't had depressions in a number of years, and it's only through the result of 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. I know that annoys a lot of people. Pray for me. <laughs> and I, I started going to A&A meetings, you know. And God, they were doing everything. And I remember I was about six months sober and had a key to the club, had my feet up on the table, and Logan, who was 56 years sober, we, we passed away with 56 years sober, 
uh, came in one day and I was in the club and he said, you think you got all the answers, don't you, kid? And I said, no, but I was thinking, yeah, pretty much got this wrapped up. <laughs> and he said, let me tell you something. I was young once, but you've never been old. <laughs> I was young once, but you've never been old. From that day to this, I don't bad rap any old timer. I celebrate them. Makes me a little annoyed when I hear somebody say, Well, if I was sober that long and acted that way, I'd rather be drunk. Well, then go do it. Well, how dare you judge that person? Were you around when they got sober? Do you have any idea the distance of their journey? They may be doing better than they've ever done in their life. How dare you? You know? Let us celebrate the old timers and Alcoholics Anonymous. I was so glad to see the old timers here this week, and I'll tell you what, a lot of places I go I don't see old timers. You know why? They're not welcome in the meetings anymore. Because they don't want to change the meetings into group therapy. They want to keep it Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> At 23 years sober, I had to make a decision you would never convince me I ever would have crossed my mind, but I had to make a conscious decision to stay in Alcoholics Anonymous. Because I was going into rooms all the time and hearing anything but Alcoholics Anonymous. Nothing about God. And all about the process. The process. Boundaries. That's all good stuff in group. That's all good stuff. This is Alcoholics Anonymous. My understanding, this is the place where anybody can go, no matter how far down or up they have been, they can come here and find peace in the God of their very own. That's what Alcoholics Anonymous is. And at about six months sober, I got honesty. At about eight months, I got a little tack to go with it. If you're new, wait for the tack. A lot less amends when you get to that part, promise you. And Father Tom come up to me. Father Tom, at about three months sober, came up to me and said, Ed, why don't you come back to church? And I said, I'll tell you why I don't go back to church. It's full of thieves, hypocrites, and liars. That's why I don't go back to church. And I felt pretty good telling him. And he looked at me and said, Well, Ed, why don't you come? One more won't hurt. I punished him. I didn't talk to him for a good three months, I'll tell you. <laughs> when you're new or if you've been used, uh, if somebody says something that really makes you mad, it's the truth. Just accept it. <laughs> yes. Save yourself some time in resentment, you know. Just. <laughs> and then they brought up that three-letter word that just made me cringe. You know, I, you know, I knew they were going to bring it up. Sooner or later, they were going to bring it up. And I waited and waited, and sure enough, they brought it up. One day, John H. said to me, Ed, what about a job? <laughs> a what? I'm still a pretty good thief. I'll cut down a little bit, but i got to make ends meet, you know. Bills to pay. <laughs> and it was all 100% no overhead, 100% turnover, you know. And they didn't care. They said, you got to stop doing that. But most importantly, you got to start being honest with how you feel. And man, there was strange territory. I never knew how I felt from beginning to end. I never knew how I felt. And if I did, I'd lie about it. And I was such a liar. I don't know about you. I would lie when the truth would serve me better. I've got a 26-year-old son out in California who's uh, in hand-to-hand -hand combat with Vicodin, and he's losing so far. And uh, he was about 18, and his mother called me one night. My, his mother called me one night and uh, said, you need to talk to your son. He's always my son when he's in trouble. He's been my son for quite a while now. <laughs> and uh, his mother said, he came home last night wearing shades in the middle of the night and talking to things that weren't there. And she said, I called the police and they talked him down. They didn't arrest him, but you need to talk to him. So I said, okay. He got on the phone and I said, hey son, how you doing? He said, yeah, dad, what's up, man? I said, how are you? He said, oh, cool, man. Everything's good. Yeah, man. I said, what happened last night? He said, you wouldn't believe it, dad. I went to Taco Bell, got a bad taco. Here's what I loved about it. I said, do you have any idea who you're trying to lay that on? And then he said, 
No, Dad, it's the truth. <laughs> How many times did I get caught in a dead lie and go, No, Dad, it's the truth. <laughs> I would lie when the truth had served me better. But I had to stop that. And I started asking questions, and then they brought up God, and I had a terrible time with God. I had a lot of ones about God. I mean to offend no one, but God was a punk, and I often said, you know, if he comes down here, I'll beat the sheet off him. And I said it with hate and anger and condemnation, because I had collected enough ones about God to convince me that he was worthless at best. What had he ever done for me? I remember when my uh, niece was, when I was 10 years old, I had a cousin that was hit and killed by a truck, and she was beautiful. If there was anybody ever Christian, it was, it was uh, Linda and a good person, and she was an honor student, and she got hit by a truck and killed. Knocked her 200 feet. And I remember going to the funeral and people saying, God must have wanted an angel. And I thought, so he hit you with a truck. <laughs> I'll pass. Yeah. Still do. <laughs> yeah. But that was one of my ones. God rips people out of your life. He's selfish. People, oh, God must have wanted them for something. Really? So that's why his family is devastated and they have no food. What a good God. And every once in a while I'd look in magazines and I'd see kids starving in Africa. And I thought, okay, God, where are you there, chump? You're so good. And I just didn't like God at all. Imagine my surprise when I got here and they said, the only way you're going to maintain any sobriety is to have a relationship with God. <laughs> oh, I got annoyed. If you would have said the J word, I would have turned over the table. <laughs> but you know what's funny? One of the things I love about Alcoholics Anonymous is you can have a God, any God you want. You can have a doorknob. You can have a rose bush, a telephone pole. You can have a sponsor, a group, you can have all that. But the only thing you can't have is Jesus. If you mention him, we'll ask you to leave the room. But we're not biased. We don't judge. You know, there's something else I wanted to share with you that I've heard a lot lately. When we begin the Lord's Prayer, people say things like, Who's Father? and all this and that. That's a Christian prayer, and that isn't kind to our Muslim and Hindu friends. We ostracize them when we say, Who's Father? I might suggest that you do it the way I've always known to do it. Do it as an invitation for those who care to join us in the Lord's Prayer, pray to the God of your understanding. You know, there's a big push to remove the Lord's Prayer from meetings. It's awfully big, and it's going to happen if you don't have active GSRs, and you're against that idea. I would strongly suggest that you have an active GSR in your meeting and that they take part in the meetings and some of the decisions that are being made. I know I went to one conference where they closed every meeting with the responsibility statement. And I talked to the uh, member of the GSO office that was there. I said, why are they doing that? And she said to me, well, Ed, we don't want to offend anybody. I said, well, you failed there. You offended me. <laughs> and uh, she said, well, we don't want to offend people of other faith. I said, do you understand that you're eliminating step 11 from meetings? That's step 11. Don't take that out of meetings. I mean, even though you don't practice it at home, pretend you do at meetings. You know, give us a break. Get off that soapbox, but I wanted to share that with you because it's happening. It's really happening. A lot of places I go, they don't even say a prayer anymore, even the serenity prayer. I mean, you've got to really be narrow-minded to find fault with that, but we've got some. And uh, I started going to meetings, and they brought up God, but they gave me some good news. They said it can be a God of your very own, and I thought, excellent. I can do that. i got a good imagination. I thought long and hard, and I came up with a God that was kind and loving and forgiving. They didn't seem to mind at all. And that's the way AA and Alamans are. If you come up with an original idea, they'll act like it's been around forever, you know? <laughs> but then I made a major mistake in my sobriety, and I share this so maybe you won't make it. Or if you do make it, you'll recognize it. I started professing a faith I didn't have. My intentions were wonderful. 
but I started professing a faith I didn't have. I hung around old timers, and I looked into old timers' eyes. Eyes are the mirror of the soul. And I want to thank all of you for your eyes this weekend that looked at me, and I looked at you, and we found God. I, I just love that, man. Eyes are the mirror of the soul. And I forgot the point I was going to make, but I guess that was it. <laughs> You're rubbing off on me, Scott. <laughs> Oh, thanks, buddy. Thank you. I guess I'll have to start all over. My name's Ed, and I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> Trouble with these canned talks, you lose your spot, you've got to go all the way back. <laughs> but they were talking about God, and it was kind and loving, and I started professing a faith I didn't have. I'd look into the eyes of old-timers, and when they talk about God, I knew they were telling the truth. I could see they were telling the truth. I couldn't figure out their angle. But I knew they were telling the truth, so I started spouting things that they said. God's in his heaven, all's right with the world. Easy does it. <laughs> I took it so easy, you had to remind me to breathe, you know. <laughs> first things first. Turn it over. And I was just a year sober, and the old man called me up and said, Ed, why don't you come over for dinner? And I thought, uh-oh. When the old man calls me up, I'm in trouble usually, you know. But I'd hung around Alcoholics Anonymous, and you told me that if there was going to be a pro uh, any improvement in the relationships in my home, it had to start with me. You know, I hear people all the time say, you know, the home's the toughest place to work this program. That's a load of crap. It's the last place we ever attempted. We're too busy trying to dazzle them at meetings, you're right. How are you doing? Oh, I'm fine. How are you? And then going home being the same jerk we'd always been, kicking the dog, being the same nasty employee or employer. You know, it ain't, the, it ain't the toughest place to work. It's just the last place we apply it. And I had to learn to do that. So I took a new attitude over to dinner that night with my old man. About halfway through dinner, he said, boy, and I thought, huh. yeah, Pop, I thought, here it comes. He said, just wanted to tell you I'm really proud of you. And um, had you asked me when I came into the room that night if I cared what my old man thought, you could have had a lie detector hooked up to me. And I would have said no and it would have said true. How grateful I am. I was so terribly wrong about that and so many other things since I've been sober. That it meant more to me than I can ever tell you. You know, they talk about, and if you're due today, uh, they talk about miracles. They're not fluffing it. Miracles happen here. But that wouldn't have even made my list of miracles, you know. The old man looking at me. I remember the day I made him cry when he beat me because I couldn't go to school. In one year with you, and he's telling me he's proud of me. What a deal. What a gift. I went to the meeting that night and got home after the meeting and I got a phone call from my mother who was crying and hysterical and she said, Ed, come home quick. And I said, what's the matter, Mom? She said, I don't know what's going on. Uh, there's police cars and sirens across the street and they're carrying bodies out and your dad's over there. And I said, okay. And I, I had this uh, emotional relationship with God. And, uh, oh, I'm with God now. Nothing bad could happen. And I pulled up that bar where I spent most of my youth drinking. I drank in there since I was 11 years old. And there were policemen everywhere. I mean everywhere. It's funny how those cops had shaped up that year I was sober. You know? <laughs> they really did. I'll, I'll share a few things with you. You don't talk about their ancestry, they usually don't talk about yours. <laughs> you don't talk about their sexual habits, they won't bring up yours. <laughs> Seems to be the way it is. But I'd been working in the courts that year through Alcoholics Anonymous, very similar to the, the, the wonderful stuff they have going in Nashville. Uh, with corrections and uh, there was just a mutual respect there and if you'd come in and had a problem they'd just give you to me for 30 days said bring him back Ed tell me what you think because those judges knew I was a walking miracle they saw it in my eyes they saw it in my eyes so when I walked in there and I saw all those policemen uh, there was a respect there that had never been there before and I walked in and I walked up to this officer and I said what's going on he said Ed uh we don't know. He said, what are you doing here? And I said, my dad was in here. He said, oh, my God. And I said, why? What's going on? He said, Ed, all we can figure out is somebody came in and opened fire and shot everybody. And I looked down the bar and I saw this pool of blood with my father's glasses all smashed up in it. And I just got cold. Cold and I didn't want to know. You don't want that information. <laughs> you just don't want that information. 
And boy, they don't want you to have that information. And uh, I just looked at the cop and I said, what do I do? Isn't that amazing? I looked at a cop and said, what do I do? And he said, Ed, I'd suggest you go up to the hospital. Some of them are alive, some of them are dead, but go up there and see if they can uh, give you any answers. So I went up to the hospital and I went in there and there was an officer who hadn't forgotten my past. And uh, he was rude and vulgar and nasty. And he said basically, and uh, for me to get out of there, and if I didn't get out of there right now, they were going to run me in for obstruction of justice. And an amazing thing happened. I said, okay. A year and a half before that, they would have been looking for a new lieutenant because nobody talks to me that way. Not still standing. And I left. And I went and I called the one cop the last five years of my drinking and activities. He tried his best to put me away. He was a good cop. He could have had me a dozen times set me up, but he wouldn't do it. He said, I'm going to catch you straight up, and you're going away. And I used to say, everything's fair in love and war, chump. That's the guy I called. Bob and I became friends over the years after that. One day we were having coffee and he said, Ed, I want to thank you. And I said, for what, Bob? He said, you know, I worked narcotics for a number of years. And he said, it's a tough job. And he said, some days I'd look at that badge and gun and he'd say, I'd just say the hell with it. It's not worth it. I'm not doing any good. He said, and then you came to mind and the way your life had changed. And he said, I was able to go to work that day one more time. Because of what you learned in Alcoholics Anonymous, you gave me hope to go on the job. That's what we do. I called Bob and he said, oh my God, Ed, all we can come up with is he's been shot and wandered outside or he's been taken hostage. And I'd always hope that you wouldn't know that kind of sense of loss, magnitude of loss, and then uh, Oklahoma City happened and September 11th happened and you know exactly how I was feeling that night. That overwhelming mass of emotions that just make you want to implode and explode at the same time. And the only thing we could come up with is we formed a search party and we searched all night for Dad. And I looked in garbage cans and under parked cars and under porches. I didn't want to look, but I had to look because he might be there. And if he was there and I didn't look, I'd feel bad. And all I could remember was the serenity prayer, one word at a time. One word at a time. After 10 hours, that cop from up at the hospital called me up and said, Well, Ed, anybody could have made a mistake. You want to come up and identify your old man? And I said, okay. And I went up there and I walked into that morgue and I saw that my father with that bullet hole in his faith, face and I reached for that faith I'd been professing and came up with a handful of mush. And I've never been lonelier or more isolated in my life. There are a lot of people that say, you know, my worst day sober is better than my best day drunk. It has not been my experience. But I'll tell you this. The worst day in your life, the grace of God and Alcoholics Anonymous can bring you through it. I know that. Because I felt so empty and so hollow, and I just, God. And I opened the door and I looked out, and there were members of Alcoholics Anonymous in Alabama, much as my friend Scott shared. And they were my God that day. They were my angels that God sent me. And you know what? They didn't say anything at all, they just looked at me. And their look told me everything I needed to know. And I remember we went everywhere I'd go, there'd be a member of AA. Big John would sit outside my house when I'd come out. And he just happened to be there and he'd give me a little wave. When I'd go to the grocery store, there'd be an Allen on there, just happened to be there, give me a little wave. And they loved me real well. At the murder trials, they caught the guy, and I remember I had to go testify. Well, first at the funeral, I want to share something with you. Because this God of my misunderstanding came back, this punk God, this God that uh, I remember years ago in church, they said, whatever you do in life will come back for generations on your family. There's something good to remember while you're sitting with your dad at the morgue. And the priest that did my funeral, it's funny, he's a priest because we were Lutheran at the time. And in the Midwest, Lutherans and Catholics didn't get along too well then. But my dad never really liked church much, and he was sick six months before he was murdered. He was sick and in the hospital. And he called the spiritual care and said, can someone come up and baptize me? And a guy named Father Grubb came up and baptized him. And the old man liked Father Grubb. 
So who else? What perfect person to do this funeral? Because it was one of those that was still Iowa's most heinous crime. It was all over the papers. It was everywhere, and it was just... Thank God it's still Iowa's most heinous crime, and I pray it remains that way forever. And uh, he did the funeral, and he said something that gave me one of the keys to the kingdom. Right in the middle of the funeral, he said, You know, a lot of people would say Clifford's death is God's will. He said, I don't believe that for a minute, and I sat right up in the pew. He said, I believe God created human beings and gave them a free will. Those individuals chose to do this, and now it's God's will. And it was like the weight of the world fell off my shoulders. You mean the God I started out with in AA could be true? Kind and loving and forgiving? Absolutely. From that day to this, if it isn't good, it isn't God. It's just that simple for me. If it isn't good and doesn't come down from the Father of Heavenly Lights, I'm not interested. And it was like the weight of the world fell off my shoulders, and I remember uh, it was so clear to me the reason kids are starving in Africa is because we're not sending them anything to eat, like right now. And uh, why I'd want to blame God for that, I don't know. It's our deal, not His. He's blessed us abundantly. Why is there so many people dying of cancer? It's real simple. We pollute everything we touch. We want to blame it on somebody else, you know? God doesn't do that. I'm not trying to make you feel guilty. I'm just trying to tell you, my God's a good God. And the mess that's caused in my life today are usually due to my actions rather than His. And I never want to forget that. And from that day to this, my God is a good God. And uh, I remember I had to go to the murder trial to testify against one of these guys. And the guys in AA made a, an impossible request. They said, Ed, you're going to have to behave in court. And I thought, what? <laughs> I mean, that's showtime. That's where you create your rep. You know, give that just, I'll give you 30 days. I can do 30 days standing on my head. Well, I'll give you 60 more to get back on your feet. <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and they told me I had to co- go to court and behave myself. And then they said to me, you might be the only example of AA anybody ever sees. So I said, okay. And I went to court, and I remember walking into the courtroom, and I see this guy sitting there. And I'm thinking, give me five minutes. We don't need a trial. In fact, bring all five of them in. Short order. But I didn't say anything except answer their questions. Because I wanted to be a good member of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I... uh remember leaving that courtroom and they convicted them all and I felt pretty good about it. Pretty soon God talked to me. Now you got to be careful when God talks to you. I hope you have a sponsor. <laughs> Sponsors are excellent God filters. They really are. I remember one time going to my sponsor said, I got a message from God. He said, oh, share it with me, Ed. <laughs> and I shared my message from God. He said, you know, Ed, this message from God looks strangely like your handwriting. <laughs> But I also need to tell you if I understand 86, 87, 88 in our big book that God will inspire me and that I'll live an inspired life if I do what it says on 86, 87, 88. Are you having a tough time sober? Are you not feeling too good? Start reading 86, 87, 88 every day for 30 days. At the end of the 30 days you will have a spiritual awakening and then you'll have another difficulty. The other difficulty is your lower power will insist you stop reading it now. It's the greatest thing I see in AA. We start doing things that make us feel better, and the minute we start feeling better, we quit doing it. And we want to rest on our laurels. But uh, 86, 87, and 88 tells me that I will have an inspired life. It tells me what to do when I've got a bad day, what I have with indecision, and how to stop and address everything in my life. And it asks me to invite my loved ones. If I sponsor you and you're married, you have morning meditation with your wife or I don't sponsor you. You know? Now, that interrupts the fighting a bit, but, you know, helps. And the reason I, I say that is because it adds to the quality of life. It's not that we don't have directions, it's just we, we're not good at applying them. You know, I hear book quoters all day long. I don't particularly care for book quoters. I don't. Big book quoters or Bible quoters. 
because they get tended wrapped up in all of their knowledge. And eventually I'll say, you know, you're quoting so much, you can't be doing half of it. I said, quote the ones you're doing. That's the ones I want to be involved with. Why? Because our lives are on the line here. Our sanity's on the line. Our soul's on the line. And if I don't take these directions and apply them in my life, no wonder I feel lost. If I don't do that, I can only be lost. If I do it, then I am found. I am found that I'm an alcoholic and that I have everything I need in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. And there are other wonderful literatures around to help me, but my basis is an understanding of Alcoholics Anonymous. I believe this. I believe God went up to Bill and Bob and said, Guys, I got this group that's making me nuts, you know. They said, What about me? What about me? What about me? Oh, me? Look what you did to me. He said, I'm going to give you the basis of 12 steps, okay? You guys talk, put it together, take care of them while I take care of the rest of the world, would you? <laughs> And to our 12 steps is like our internet connection to the spiritual reality, you know. And God talked to me and said, Eric, go out to California, go into show business. Okay. And I went out to Anaheim. I got a job at Disneyland. I was goofy. <laughs> I saw him at breakfast this morning. Yeah. <laughs> Don't step on goofy shoes. You know, but... Had a little hostility problem, two and a half years sober, no, no sponsor, no, not going to many meetings. Yeah, I was goofy. I never actually started that job because I was invited. I got the job and then I was invited to a meeting up to West L.A. And I walked into a meeting of people enthusiastic, very much like the people I'd run into here in Florida. The th enthusiasm, that God from within just screaming, uh, I was lost but I am found, I have a new freedom. And I just loved that. I'd never seen that before, and it was great. And I went up the next week, and it was the same thing. And there was this guy running around. I said, excuse me, would you be my sponsor? He said, no. I kind of knew the A&A &A deal. You know, you can't refuse an A&A class. And he come up a few I said, why won't you sponsor me? He said, anybody I sponsor has to look up to me. Ha, <laughs> I thought, oh, bad. You know, tall joke. That's really going to help me. And he laughed and he said, if you agree to do a few things, I'll be glad to sponsor you. My name's Clancy. And I am forever grateful I didn't hear some of the crap that goes around about him, even if it's true. I'll tell you why. I would have heard you, I would have listened, and you would have killed me. Your viciousness would have killed me because I believe you. The harshness and the criticism and character assassination, the gossip, it's got to stop. It's killing people. I try my best not to put down any group or individual in AA. I may not like them, I may not like their group, but it may be your answer to life, and I, I, I urge you to try it. And if you like what I have to offer, I'll be happy to share that with you. But it's not my job to take their inventory. It's my job to keep on top of mine. And uh, he insisted that I actually work these steps, that I actually apply them. I remember one day I said, can we talk about the steps and go through the book? He said, you can't read? And I said, uh, well, yeah, he said, uh, well, read the black and white, Ed. There's 12 steps listed there. Read that and do that. Oh, okay. Because I wanted to talk about it, and I wanted to stretch it out, and I wanted to find the deeper meanings of it all. I wouldn't do it much, but I'd, I'd like to think about it. He told me, I don't want you to go to discussion meetings. I said, why? He said, you're the type of person that's going to go to a discussion meeting. First half of the meeting, you're going to think about what you're going to say. After you talk, you're going to spend the rest of the meeting thinking about what you should have said and what you should have said. I thought, how do you know? And he said, I just want you to go. And he said, if you happen to end up in the discussion meeting, you state your name and disease and you pass. I did that for 15 years. I became a wonderful listener. I heard the message of Alcoholics Anonymous rather than the crap I was trying to dream up. I really believe that what you have to say is far more important than what I have to say. 
and I want to give you the respect of my listening. I want to congratulate everybody here on how attentive you've been to the speakers and not disruptive. What respect you show, and I thank you for that. And, and, and I just feel so blessed to be able to hear people now. To hear people and to see people. So I'm real glad he did that. He said, I, I want you to start shaking hands with everybody. And at that time, the group was small. It was only about 400. And he said, I said, I don't want to shake their hands. I don't like them people. He said, they don't like you either, Ed. Go shake them. <laughs> Hi, I'm Ed. Hi, I'm Ed. Hi, I'm Ed. Still was working on my anger. I was down in Bowling Green two years ago. And the guy walked up to me and said, Hi, Ed, how you doing? I said, Oh, great, nice to see you. He said, You know, I used to go to meetings with you all the time. I said, Well, you look kind of familiar. Yeah, yeah, nice to see you. He said, I remember the last time I was at a meeting with you. I said, Really? Why is that? And he said, You knocked the guy out with one punch. And I go, oh, crap. Shh, don't you know. I'll share this story with you, not certainly because I'm proud of it. I'm at this meeting, working on my anger. <laughs> And there's this guy in front of me, talking away during participation. I tap him on the shoulder, say, you know, I can't hear the participants. Can you kind of hold it down? He said, yeah, okay. And out there, there's a, a hour, there's 20 minutes participation, 10 minute coffee break, a main speaker for an hour. So uh, at the coffee break, he got up and he said, don't, don't be touching me. Don't. And I said, no, no, you don't understand. It. I wasn't trying to be rude or anything. And little Alice, God bless her, come over and running over, said, Big Ed, sit down. Big Ed, sit down. I said, oh, honey, I'm fine. I'm doing good, honey. And I'm still trying to explain it to the guy, you know. And uh, <laughs> I said to him again, I'm not trying to, you know, you just were talking a lot, and I don't think you knew how loud you were talking. And Alice come over again. Ed, Big, big Ed, sit down. Big Ed, sit down. I said, oh, honey. I'm fine. She sat down. I turned around. He said, don't you ever. And the next thing I know, he's flying over four rows of chairs. <laughs> My first thought was, how am I going to explain this to Clancy? <laughs> and my program kicked in. So I went around the chairs and I woke him up and made amends. <laughs> I sponsored him for the next five years. He said nobody had ever gotten his attention before. So. <laughs> but I'm not proud of that. I, I strongly suggest to you that only certain conditions should anybody be restrained in a meeting or physically touched, and uh, that's not one of them. Uh, shortly after that, I was driving out to a Thousand Oaks on the, on the San Diego freeway. I'm going out to give my spiritual talk. And um, this guy cuts me off. Now, I don't know. Maybe I cut him off. I don't know. But he cuts me off and he locks up the brakes tells me I'm number one. <laughs> then when you got anger like I had, he did something you love. He went. He pulls over. I pull over and wait. Because once he gets out of the car, he's mine. He's got to get out first. I know the rules. He's got to get out first. He's mine. He opens the door. I get out, grab him by the crotch in his shirt, and throw him over his nice new Audi. <laughs> and I thought, well, that really isn't a spiritual thing to do, Ed. So I, <laughs> I went around, I picked him up, and I brushed him off. I put him in his Audi, and I said, you know, I'm a member of a 12-step program, and when we do wrong, we just... Uh, his eyes were this big, and he said, no, no. So my working on my anger didn't work well at all. I found out I had to totally surrender it. Period. I surrender it and back away from it. Period. Because if I have anything to do with it, it's going to come out to hurt me or you. And oddly enough, that's what it says in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. We must be free from anger. I remember I went to speak in a meeting in Pasadena, California, and Pasadena is a wealthy area, and I thought, ooh, Pasadena might hook up with a job, might give. and I caught myself doing that little hustle, and after my father's death, I did something that's most important. I started all over with God. My first honest prayer was, God, I don't know if you're there or not. I sure hope so. Boy, that's honest. 
That was it, man. That was core stuff. And that was my God. And I caught myself doing that hustle about Pasadena and wealthy area. And I went down and I got on my knees said the same prayer I said before I came down here this morning. I said, God, let me go and share the miracle you've performed in my life through Alcoholics Anonymous. Save me from my own nonsense. I used to use another word. Now I use nonsense. And I said, most of all, I don't want anything from any of these people. I'd been vastly overpaid. And I left. And I went to that meeting, and after the meeting, some guy came up to me and said, This makes no sense to me. I want to offer you a job. He said, It makes perfect sense to me. He said, Have you ever been in Taiwan? I said, No. He said, Have you ever been in show business management? I said, No. He said, Be in my office Monday morning. <laughs> went to his office in Century City Monday morning. Uh, Thursday, that next Thursday, I was lifting out of China Airlines out of Los Angeles International Airport, going to Taipei, Taiwan. I was soon to be the new vice president of America on Ice. I had a cast of 63. I was going over to Taiwan, negotiate with the Taiwanese government, building the actual stage and uh, ice rink. And then I was flying back and forth with designer Bill Campbell to design the costumes. How were you doing that week? <laughs> the reason I share that with you is it's not about me, it's about you. You talked me into dropping my bag of ones. There would have been a time when I wouldn't even showed up for the interview. Because one of my ones was people like you can't do things like that. You're not smart enough. You're white trash. You're worthless. You convinced me different. And I showed up. And it was great. I loved it. I got off the plane. Everybody's this tall. <laughs> I'm looking at them and they're looking at me, you know. I knew it was just a matter of time before they tied me down. <laughs> Don't have time to tell you a lot about that, but what I can tell you is it showed me that I had gifts and talents that I would have never believed I had unless I saw me do them. That's my loving God. He lets me see what I need to see. I like two-word prayers. For a number of years, my prayers were clarity and courage. Give me clarity to see what I need to do and the courage to do it. Today, my two-word prayer is teachable and reachable. I want to always remain teachable and reachable. And in that time, it was just a blessed time. And I'm down in Kaohsiung, and a guy come past me, and he said, You know, Ed, you'd be an excellent manager for the Harlem Globetrotters. And I went, <laughs> That's pretty good. I like that. Went home to Los Angeles. Three months later, the Harlem Globetrotters called me up. <laughs> said, Mr. Mutum, we've heard wonderful things about you. Would you come into our office? And I said, I'd be honored to. And I went into their office and had a short eight-hour interview. <laughs> I don't hide my past from anybody. My past don't own me anymore. I hear a lot of people say, oh, I don't know if I should tell them I'm alcoholic and all that. Well, that's up to you. All I know is nothing's ever harmed me. You know, I told you about my family life, but there was one time every year when my family life was amazing. It was on a Sunday afternoon, usually in January, on Wide World of Sports. And this basketball team had come on TV, and Dad would always be sober for it. And Mom and Pop popcorn. And we'd all be sitting around the TV, and then they'd all get together, and these guys would come out and form a circle, and they'd start playing Sweet Georgia Brown. And they'd start whipping that ball around, and everybody in my house smiled. Imagine how I felt in Madison Square Gardens when I gave them the sign to begin and they started playing Sweet Georgia Brown. Now, if there is no God, how did I get from 6th and Leclerc laying in the middle of the street at 18 below zero to manager the Harlem Globetrotters in Madison Square Garden in seven and a half years? How does that happen if there is no God? If you have another explanation, I'd be happy to listen to you and then laugh about it with you. <laughs> I met kings and queens and presidents. I traveled all over the world. I uh, was traveling in limos and Mercedes and suites, and it was a great time. I had a great time. But I also learned a valuable lesson. I always thought if I had those things, then this would be okay. And a lot of times, this makes it worse. I'd much rather work for a guy just work with a guy just coming off the streets or a gal just coming off the streets because their defenses are down. They don't have the nice home saying, I'm, I, I can't be alcoholic because, I can't be alcoholic because. Alcoholism has nothing to do with here. Skid Row's right here. 
And if you drink too much. You know, they always talk about, I wish they had a big book up here. Um, they always talk about, uh, no, that's right. Uh, they always talk about the definitions of alcoholism. On page 44, there's a wonderful one. It simply says, if, you got one, Lee? Okay. What is it? 45? I've got five minutes? Are you kidding me? I've hardly got sober. Oh. <laughs> Thanks, buddy. <laughs> no, that's okay. Thank you. Um, I uh, no, no, I know that. I'm trying. I'm fast forwarding in my head. <laughs> so then I got a call to the ministry. And it was wonderful. I'd never expected it. I was on a Christian retreat. I'd lost everything I owned. I went back to Iowa. I still had a seventh grade education. They said, it's fine that you want to be a minister, but if you're going to be a minister in our denomination, you need about 230 hours of college credit, which I do have now. It took me seven years to do it. I was happy to do it because that's what they asked me to do. I play by their rules. No, I don't play by my rules. If I want to be part of your club, I follow your rules. And so I did that. Now, the amazing thing about that is I never thought I was smart enough to pass a class. That's why I never went back to school. I'd give you all kinds of excuses, but that's why. And I became a pastor, and a few years ago I was uh, uh, given a sermon on forgiveness. Right in the middle of the sermon I realized I hadn't told the guys who killed my father that I forgave him. And I stopped. Because what I tell you I hated about church. Hypocrites. And I said, I will not finish this sermon till I find the guys who killed my father and tell them that they're forgiven. You see, I'd done it a long time ago, but that's only half the deal. If they don't know, it's only half an amend. And as God would have it two and a half weeks later, one of these guys' sentences was overturned. And uh, I'll tell you how well AA works. I couldn't remember the names of the guys who killed my father. Now, if you've ever had resentment, you know what a miracle that is. And the press came to me and said, what do we do? You know, they, they overturned the sentence, retry him, let him go. What do you think? And I said, let him go. Let him go. Uh, it's time to start new. And uh, he said, well, he went in there when he was 17. Where is he going to live? How is he going to feed himself? I said, he can come live with me if he'd like. And people were taken back by that. And I'm not sure why. You welcomed me into these rooms. You welcomed me into your homes. How dare I not welcome him? What did he do that I wasn't capable of, given the right situation, the right amount of alcohol, and the right mood? <laughs> that story went around the world. Oprah called me, 48 Hours called me, 2020 called me, said, how did you do that? I said, well, step eight and nine. If you're really working eight and nine... Yeah. <laughs> and... Uh, Long story short, because we're running short of time here, uh, two and a half weeks later I found myself walking down a prison cell, a prison that I swore I'd never go in because my brother spent, I spent most of my youth visiting my brother there. And I walked into this uh, cell and I saw a guy I hadn't seen for 27 and a half years. Last time I saw him I thought, you give me five minutes with this punk, we don't need a trial. And I stuck out my hand and I said, Sherman, my name's Reverend Ed Mutum and I'm here to tell you that I love you and God loves you. And I forgive you and God forgives you. And if there's anything I can ever do to make your life better, please allow me to do that. And a tremendous feeling took place. And he looked into his old timer's eyes and he knew I was telling the truth. He couldn't quite figure out the angle. But he knew I was telling the truth. And we talked for two and a half hours. And we closed that meeting with the Lord's Prayer. And the warden and the state's attorney and everybody was sobbing because the healing was complete. And I talked to my county attorney friend. He let him plead to second-degree murder. And he served a couple more years, and I got to go up and pick him up in prison. I was the only one they'd trust. Because, as I said, there's a lot of animosity toward him yet. And I got to get him his first apartment, buy him some decent clothes, and get him going. He fell in love, and I haven't seen him since, and that makes perfect sense. <laughs> And people said, how can you do that? How could you do that? I could say the same thing to you. How could you take a person who was totally worthless, wanting to die every minute of the day, and put a light in him that he wants everybody to see? That Alcoholics Anonymous works and God is good. 
a day at a time. Thank you.